Now, from Wish TV, your local news source, this is All Indiana Politics. Good Sunday morning. Welcome to another edition of All Indiana Politics. I'm Phil Sanchez, a native son on the campaign trail. Former Vice President and Indiana Governor Mike Pence launched his bid for the presidency in Iowa. And he did so with a blistering rebuke to former President Donald Trump. News 8's government reporter Garrett Perquist was the only TV reporter from Indiana at the kickoff near Des Moines. Pence pulled no punches regarding former President Donald Trump. He split with him on several issues, but reserved his harshest words for the events of January 6, 2021. Now, while some in this contest have already taken to criticizing the record of the Trump-Pence administration, let me be clear. I'm incredibly proud of everything we accomplished for the American people. <laughs> Together. Together, in three short years, we cut taxes, we destroyed ISIS, we stood with our allies and stood up to our enemies as never before. We made the strongest military in the history of the world stronger than ever before. We gave historic prosperity at home that lifted all Americans, regardless of race or creed or color. We achieved energy independence. And maybe, and maybe most important of all, it was our administration that appointed three of the justices that sent Roe versus Wade to the ash heap of history where it belongs. <laughs> Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution provides that the President of the Senate, the Vice President, shall, in the presence of the Senate and the House, open all the certificates and the votes shall be counted. No more, no less. Despite the fact that the Constitution's language is clear and provides the Vice President with no authority to reject or return electoral votes, my former running mate continues to insist that I had the right to overturn the election. But President Trump was wrong then. And he's wrong now. I will always believe, by God's grace, I did my duty that day. I kept my oath to ensure the peaceful transfer of power under the Constitution of the United States of America. Now, now, Let me say from my heart, I understand the disappointment that many still feel about the outcome of the 2020 election. I can relate. I was on the ballot. <laughs> but I had no right to overturn the election. And Kamala Harris will have no right to overturn the election when we beat them in 2024. <laughs> Finally, let me say to my countrymen, I'll always be grateful for what President Trump did for this country. I've often prayed for him over the past few years. And I prayed for him again today. I had hoped he would come around and see that he had been misled about my role that day. But that was not to be. So let me say, I stand before you today as a candidate for president to say to the Republican Party, the Republican Party must be the party of the Constitution of the United States. Look, we've had enough of the Democrats and the radical left repeatedly trampling on our Constitution, threatening to pack the court to dismantle the God-given rights that are enshrined there. We must stand on the Constitution to protect the God-given right to life. We must stand on the Constitution to protect 
the right to keep and bear arms. We must stand for the Constitution to protect the right to live, to work, to worship according to the dictates of our faith and conscience. The American people must know that leaders in the Republican Party will keep our oath to support and defend the Constitution even when it's not in our political interest to do so. One last word that in part brings us here today. I believe that anyone who puts themselves over the Constitution should never be President of the United States. And anyone who asks someone else to put them over the Constitution should never be President of the United States again. Pence faces an uphill battle in the polls. A new survey by Morning Consult puts him in third among the Republican field with 7% of the vote. Trump topped that survey with 56%. In Des Moines, I'm Garrett Bergquist for Wish TV, wishtv.com, and like us on Facebook. All right, coming up, an unusual declaration for a race that technically isn't on the ballot. Welcome back. Each party's delegates will pick the nominee for lieutenant governor at next year's state party conventions. Voters don't have any say in that contest, but that hasn't stopped the Hamilton County pastor from launching a campaign for that office. I spoke with Pastor Micah Beckwith about his decision to run. And let's welcome in Pastor Micah Beckwith now. Uh, Micah, good to see you. Thanks for, for coming on with us here on All Indiana Politics. It's great to be with you, Phil. Thanks for having me. So, so why do you want to make another political run? Well, I know the Lord wasn't uh, having us run for Congress in 2020 just for that and then to be done. And it was all about influence. It's all about teaching people what does the Constitution say? What is the order of good governance? And, uh, and so I've been doing that for the last two and a half years, even after our congressional race. It, God has opened up the door for me to, to speak and to teach. And, and uh, really, I knew we weren't done. And so when the idea of, okay, how can we check and balance our government started hitting me even harder, especially over the last four years with Governor Holcomb doing some things that I think are patently unconstitutional. I said, why was that happening? And if you look at it, one of the places we've dropped the ball is that the lieutenant governor really is designed to be a check and a balance to the governor. It's not supposed to be a yes man. And we've kind of given that over to the governor as an extension of his own office. And really the delegates at the, the party convention it's their voice that should decide who the lieutenant governor is as a check and balance to be the voice, the representative voice of the delegates. And so we've gotten away from that. And I want to get back to that and give the voice to the delegates and be a check and balance, speak truth to power, but really making sure that we're constitutionally aligned uh, and we're, we're basing our, our republic on conservative values that really, I, I believe, are going to be best for all people. That kind of brings me to my next question. Um, your bid, as you know, for the lieutenant governorship is a little bit unconventional because it usually is the person who is running for governor that picks their their right hand man or, 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 or lady, as you very well know. So uh, why pursue it this way and why not just pursue the governorship? I mean, again, one, I think it's the Lord's leading me down this path. We've really we've really been praying a lot about over the last couple of years. All right, Lord, what's next? But I think that's that's paramount. Um, you know, I'm an I'm an influencer. I, I I look at politics and just everything I'm doing as a pastor is just it's all about influence. How are you going to teach and influence people in the right direction? The lieutenant governor's office, in my opinion, has been drastically underused over the course of the last 50 years. We don't really see it as a as someone who can really influence our state in the right direction. And that's what I bring to the table. I, I say, hey, listen, I know what our constitution says. I teach the constitution. I, I understand it. I want to I want to take it to the next generation. I want to make sure that they're being influenced in what is right and moving in that direction. And and so really the governor's office is is uh is an office where you you're you're legislate you're working with the legislator you're you've got a lot of responsibilities as the governor the lieutenant governor's office is really more how can we be influential and and that's that's where I, that's my strengths i i can say okay let's take a message and move it out to the people i can be that uh that 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 person who uses that bully pulpit to get out a message of conservative constitutional values and and so that's that's why the lieutenant governor i think fits me really really well you said it before that you disagreed with some of the things that Governor Eric Holcomb has done over his term in office. What happens if a governor is in office that you don't agree with? How do you see that playing out? 
Yeah, well, I think that's good for the Republic. I think that's how our founders designed it to be, where, listen, if there's ever disagreements, the 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 checks and balances are supposed to kind of clash a little bit so that we get the right solution. And, you know, I think with Governor Holkin, while I respect him personally as a governor, I think he's really just drastically dropped the ball on some really important issues, one being the shutdown. He didn't have the constitutional authority to shut down churches, to to shut down businesses, but there was nobody in his in his executive branch that was really pushing back on him. And I think that would be something if I were in that in that seat as lieutenant governor, I said, you can't do this, governor. Now, ultimately, he's the one that makes the choice. But again, it's about influence. It's who's in his circle helping him make what are good decisions. And that's what I can bring to the table. And, um, you know, things like he vetoed the women's sports bill. I was I was opposed to that veto. He fought against constitutional carry. I, I was opposed to him fighting against constitutional carry. So those would be some things that I would bring into the executive branch, ultimately knowing it's his authority. It's not mine as lieutenant governor. It's his authority that makes the choice. I would just help to influence and, and push in the right direction. You've been pretty outspoken about public education over the years. If you are, if you do become the lieutenant governor, where do you see that going? What do you see the challenges being? Especially, I mean, half the, the budget is goes towards public education. So w what is your vision for that? Well, we're, we are, what we're doing is not working. I'm going to tell you that right now. 63% of our entire annual budget goes to education in some form or fashion. Over 50% goes to under, uh, undergrad uh, or, uh, high school, elementary, middle school education. My mom was a teacher. My grandpa was a principal. Fundamentally, we need great teachers. We need to resource those great teachers, but we're not doing that. It's going to the administrative state is what's happening. It's going to things that really aren't getting to the students. So I've been an outspoken critic of public education, not because of the teachers, but because the system itself is broken and we need to fix the system. But it's hard to fix the system when you don't have people who are willing to take the arrows and to fight against the status quo. And I think even, you know, Phil, just my run for lieutenant governor says I go against the status quo. I'm not just going to go along to get a, get along. I'm going to I'm going to look at the situation and use logic and reason and, and truth and, and authority. who has the authority to fix public education, first and foremost. And, and we're going to find a solution, but it can be fixed. It's just right now. You know, scripture says the love of money is the root of all evil. And there's a lot of money that's not getting to the people that it needs to go to because, you know, again, people don't want it to get to the people it needs to go to. So, so again, I'm going to, I'm going to fight for our public education, but I'm going to do it in a way that says, no, let's get that money to the, the students and to the teachers and to the families that really need it and, and bypass the bureaucratic agency system that we've, we've created. Coming up, another historic indictment and big moves in the Republican primary. Indiana's best political team will make sense of it all. Welcome back to All Indiana Politics as we welcome in two members of Indiana's best political team, Democrat Ariel Brandy and Republican Whitley Yates. Let's begin with the biggest story of the week, ladies. Former President Donald Trump now faces federal charges over alleged mishandling of classified documents. Ariel, we'll start with you. Compare this to the other criminal probes against Trump. How worried should he be about this one? I mean, he should be very worried. I mean, the amount of counts that are going against him for willfully holding these classified documents. At this point, like, what more can this man hold within his home than he had when he was president? I mean, it's very concerning. The even more concerning part is that there are still Republicans here in Indiana that are still thinking that he is a leader and his style and tactics and how he led this country are something that they're trying to model after. I mean, that's concerning for me, especially when you're looking at someone who's looking at a federal indictment and has all of these charges for withholding these classified documents that were not supposed to be in his possession after he left office. To further that discussion, Whitley, the former president now faces two criminal indictments, as you very well know. We could see more from <laughs> other investigations. Is this only going to further fire up his base going into the primary or could this cause Republican voters to look elsewhere? I think that this move and this indictment is going to continue to fire up the base and almost turn him into a martyr because the truth is that he's not the only person who had documents. The truth is that President Biden also had documents scattered all over the country in places that no longer work in his garage and all of these different places, but we don't see any charges for him. And I think that some of his documents particular were from when he was vice president and not even just in his current presidency. And so you're seeing the treatment is misaligned with what Biden did versus 
what Trump did. And so it's almost looking persecutory. And I would feel better if they would just allow uh, both of them to run their races as opposed to trumping up charges on Trump to make him seem as though he is not a good leader or someone that should be running for president. Ariel, I'll let you respond to that. Yeah, I mean, flat out, Blank, he's not a good leader. I mean, when you're someone who has led this country and you have overthrown the government and then you continue to get federal charges over and over and over again, and it just increasingly gets gets worse, I don't think that anyone would want someone like that running this country. And those that do really need to reevaluate how they're thinking about we, how we need to govern the United States of America. It's problematic. He's problematic. And withholding these documents are just, it's not good for anyone. So you don't believe that Biden having documents in places he no longer works, that he should also be receiving charges as well from when he I was mean, a Biden he also, he also admitted to that and took the steps to move forward with it. Trump has not. I mean, what? he's just willingly withheld this stuff and tried to move it out of the way before folks can even get there. But then he ends up getting caught up. So, no, right, I well. don't. Well, we'll see what happens with that investigation. We have other news to get to because this past week, as you ladies know, Mike Pence's presidential announcement went down. Willie Pence effectively called former President Donald Trump unfit to serve another term. Has Pence automatically limited himself to a small portion of Republican voters, in your opinion? Um, I don't know what portion he's limited himself to, but what I will say is there will be a splintering. Before, it was a Trump Pence ticket. And so you got. You know, they were together like peanut butter and jelly. Now you're separating them and they're going against each other. I'm not necessarily sure how that is going to swing. Obviously, people who are pro-Trump are going to continue to ride with Trump, but I think that more conservatives may then choose to go with his, but they're not the only two in the race. Also have the defensive factor that we haven't necessarily looked at, and we don't know what his base and what his supporters are also going to do. So you've got the three very strong candidates running on the Republican side. Ariel, the Democratic Party called out Pence's decision to launch his campaign in Iowa rather than Indiana. Are you surprised that he made that decision? I mean, I am. I thought, if anything, he would come back to his roots and be right here where, you know, he got his start. But as we can see, that wasn't the case. We've seen other candidates who have come out of Indiana who have launched their presidential campaigns um, come back home and talk about uh, where they got started. But also, too, like we cannot forget the politics and the things that Pence did while he was here in the state of Indiana. So maybe it was a better idea for him not to be here um, because he did not make it better for us as Hoosiers. And now as he's looking to run for president, I mean, I'm going to be very interested to see where folks align because there is going to be such a splinter. But I just don't think that Pence is going to make it to Indiana by that time. Your thoughts on that decision, Whitley, and is that an optical problem for him? I don't believe it's an optical problem. I believe he knows that he has a strong base here in Indiana. And I think that him being kind of late to announce, considering we've got Nikki Haley, we've got Tim Scott, we've got former President Trump, we've got Ron DeSantis, and now Pence, I think he's being strategic with the Iowa caucus that are going to be coming up, that he wanted to make a big splash in a place where he would need guaranteed support in order He's the primary candidate. I have a minute left. I want to get both of you in. Uh, does Mike Pence have a realistic shot at the Republican nomination? Whitley, you go first on this. I would say absolutely he does, as long as he puts in the work, builds relationships around the nation, and has a clear and solid plan for America. Ariel. I mean, I think he can try, but I think it's going to be hard. Right now, the GOP seems to align more with those that are super far right. And with the craziness and wanting to have culture wars. He's done a little bit that of that here in Indiana and under Trump's um, vice presidency, but I really don't see him sticking out like a lot of the other candidates, which is perfectly fine with me because we saw how he governed, and I would prefer that not to be someone who leads our country. Well, the political clock, as they say, is ticking. Ladies, good to see you both. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. We will be right back. Take all Indiana politics on the go with you. Download our podcast now. Part of the All Indiana Podcast Network and allindianapodcastnetwork.com. Thank you for joining us for All Indiana Politics this week. We'll be back here next Sunday morning at 930 as we are every single Sunday. Big news coming out of Miami this week. All eyes will be on that city as we await the indictment, possible indictment of former President Donald Trump. More on that at wishtv.com. Also, it's a part of our All Indiana Pod Podcast Network at wishtv.com as well. That's it for us. Have a great rest of your weekend.